whatsoever a man soweth by edward h hurlbut sampson city editor of the san francisco inquirer sat scowling over the times and the herald stripped blackly across the front pages of those rival morning papers was the unaccustomed seven-column lead suspect jailed for monteagle murder norton it was sampson's voice when sampson shot that curt call in his ugly voice through the swinging doors of his office i felt as though the warden was calling me from the condemned cell for the drop only the able-bodied newspaper man who has been trimmed hard by the men of the opposition papers can understand the sensation it belongs in its exquisite misery solely to such as speak the language of the tribe for the head in the inquirer my story had been only a three-column police are baffled in monteagle mystery sampson contemplated me coldly and long he fairly brooded over me but there was no outburst and that after all hurt worse than if he had put me on the irons for a broiling ralph monteagle broker millionaire well-known popular and engaged to the equally well-known and popular helen dennison had been found in his office on the fourth floor of the sutton building stabbed to death no weapon was found the door was locked the window shut neither money nor valuables were taken the knife curiously had been sliced once across each cheek evidently done after death with deliberate intent to mar the features monteagle had entered his offices at nine fifteen o'clock on monday evening the watchman had discovered the crime at midnight the system in the sutton building permitted an absolute check on all persons entering the building after eight o'clock when the outer doors were locked any person coming in after that hour was admitted by the watchman murray who until twelve o'clock was stationed in the lobby the night elevator man kept a record of each person entering the building and to which room he went it was a building given over to brokers capitalists and large law firms and several robberies of magnitude had brought about this particular system of keeping a check on all persons in the building after night the elevator man on going off duty at midnight turned his book over to the watchman who thereupon made the rounds of each of the offices where there were still tenants or visitors it was in this manner that the crime had been discovered after murray had rapped repeatedly on monteagle's door and had finally admitted himself with his master key only three other tenants had been in the building during the evening and they were able to clear themselves of all suspicion the police turned their attention to the attaches of the building suspicion fell on a janitor stromberg who had the fourth and fifth floors apparently clinching proof of the police suspicions had been afforded when stromberg's jumper blood-stained was located at his laundry it was in the arrest of stromberg which had taken place late the night before that i had been scooped through my zealousness in leaving the detectives uncovered while i followed a lead that subsequently proved entirely wrong stromberg claimed to have cut his hand with a scraper while cleaning the mosaic tiling and had a deep gash on the ball of his thumb the police theory was that he had gashed himself purposely and in answer to his defense that it would have been an insane thing for him to have sent his jumper to the laundry if he had committed the crime held to the theory that he had taken precisely that method in combination with the self-imposed gash on his hand to divert suspicion by seeming frankness with the commendable faculty of the american police in usually working to fasten the crime upon whomsoever they may happen to have in custody the officers were devoting their energies to cinching their case on stromberg when sampson had completed his disquieting survey of me he finally said i am giving this story to ransom and dixon to handle to-day i could see that he had it all figured out in his cold-blooded way that nothing else was to be expected of me than to be scooped and that any remarks would be superfluous but it ground me what i want you to do he continued nastily is to find lanagan possibly you can succeed in that at least i wouldn't be sorry at that if some more of you fellows drank the brand of liquor lanagan drinks once in a while i might get a story out of the bunch of you occasionally instead the times and the herald give it to us on the features of this story three days running three days 
it's the worst beating i've had in a year you find lanagan and tell him i want him to jump into the story independent of ransom and dixon i would like to get the tail feathers out of this thing anyhow ransom and dixon had no relish for the story three days old might as well try to galvanize a corpse grumbled ransom i turned over to them what matters i had that might bear watching and was about to leave the office when the phone rang for me very fortunately it was lanagan and i couldn't forbear a sort of gulp because i felt instinctively that he had wakened up somewhere out of his ten days lapse with the knowledge that i was handling the monteagle story and was getting badly beaten on it i was right in that too thought i would catch you before you left he said his voice was throaty and i judged that he had been seeing some hard days and nights suppose that uh, pickled jellyfish of a samson has been lacing you you should be laced met brady a few minutes ago and he said you were handling or mishandling the story you ought to get a month's layoff for letting that crowd of two by four dubs on the times at least get the best of you come on down i want to talk things over he was at billy connor's buckets of blood that famed barroom rendezvous by the hall of justice where the thieves clans were wont to foregather there was nothing of particular coincidence in his ringing me up just when he did it was shortly after one o'clock the hour when the local staff reported on and he would be sure of finding me in he sat at the rear alcove table with king monahan you know my friend the king of course was his greeting monahan a one time designated king of the pickpockets after serving two terms had retired from the active practice of that profession to establish himself it was generally believed not only as a fence handling exclusively the precious stones but also as a sort of local organizer to whom any outside gang must report on or before beginning any operation in san francisco there is a system in crime these days as in all things else kind of stuck it in and broke it off didn't they he continued i've stood one panning from samson i don't want another from you i retorted savagely norrie he said you overlooked a very vital point the king and i have been talking it over he had the three morning papers spread out before him and we have concluded that there was a woman in the case and when two eminent criminologists like kid monahan and jack lanagan agree that there is a woman in a case it at least is worthy of consideration a mall sure vouchsafed monahan in his diffident way he had a manner as timorous as a girl which possibly accounted for the success that he enjoyed while practising his profession he was not one on the crowded platform of a trolley car who would be immediately suspected when some proletarian raised a cry of sneak thief and sought in vain for a stick pin watch or wallet stromberg may or may not be guilty said lanagan but i don't think much of the case the police have made against him it at least doesn't bar us from another line of speculation tell me for instance why in the name of the seven sons didn't some of you sleuths go off on the theory that whoever committed that crime got into the office earlier in the evening and remained concealed in the closet until monteagle came in it would have been the easiest thing in the world to have decoyed monteagle to his office even if it wasn't known that he was working nights to make up for the lunches and bachelor dinners and afternoon teas that he's been going to on account of his coming marriage and as for whoever committed the murder getting out you have been on the scene in too many murders not to know the hysteria that comes over a bunch of yaps like that it's a safe bet they all ran for a regular policeman and that whoever was in that room provided he was still there or she when the crime was discovered could have walked out of that building with a fairway as wide as market street murray ran for a policeman i admitted and some of the janitors with him that's what special cops usually do was lanagan's comment and it's a safe bet that those square-head janitors all ran with him they didn't stay around those corridors alone after that crime was discovered until a regular copper came along i've seen the thing happen and so has every police reporter in the business lanagan paused pushed back a half-drained suisses and called for a sweet soda his curious habit when breaking off a lapse whoever killed monteagle he continued was in that room when he entered always assuming of course that it was not stromberg 
now i have something additional through the king and his invaluable sources of information on men and affairs it is this monteagle is known to certain portions of the night life he was a two-faced society blatherskite with a broad streak of primal vulgarity who drank tea in swagger drawing-rooms with his fiancée and her friends in the afternoon and champagne with an entirely different social set after midnight you know the kind was rather keen about women in an underhanded quiet way it is not difficult for a man of his means to do a lot of things behind the unassailable french restaurant walls and get by with it you recall the knife was drawn neatly across both cheeks i see you indulged in a theory that he possibly was the victim of some blackmail brotherhood you even hinted at the mafia i am surprised at you you ought to let that exaggerated institution rest for a while i have a little theory of my own on that knifing business which i think we will now work upon phone samson when you get a chance that it pleases lanagan to go to work for his sweatshop wages again we parted company with monahan after he had promised lanagan to drift through his particular world or that portion of it which was up then and endeavour to learn something of the identity of any of monteagle's affiliations under the rose we headed for the sutton building and in the lobby found murray just coming on duty do you think any one could have gotten out of that room in the excitement after you found the body asked lanagan no sir said murray with aged preciseness i locked the door on the outside when i went for an officer and it could not have been opened because in my hurry i left my master's key turned in the lock when i went for a policeman so much for lanagan's a very plausible theory of the getaway he came up from it as suave as ever and asked could any one have been in that room before monteagle came in do you suppose no sir said murray with the didacticism of the aged again no sir there was nobody in that room i know because the elevator boy denny heard the telephone bell ringing for eight or ten times and finally let himself in and answered it but the party hung up mr monteagle was very free and easy with us men which accounts for denny taking the liberty there was nobody in that room when denny was in there and that was well after eight o'clock after i came on duty it all gets me sir how that knife sticker got into that room or how he got out after he got there i don't like to think old stromberg had a hand in it but it looks a leetle black for ole according to the papers i know my skirts are clear we went on up to the room the public administrator with monteagle's lawyer and his stenographer was there the lawyer was inclined to get forward but the administrator was a good programmer for a newspaper man and smoothed matters over lanagan was studying the stenographer intelligent of feature stylishly but plainly dressed and bearing about her eyes and mouth very plain indications of the nervous tension under which she must have laboured during the last three days she was one of that type of well-poised secretary stenographers found in most large offices lanagan made an opportunity of asking her did mr monteagle have any enemies that you know of persons who have threatened him personally by letter or over the phone none that i know of she replied quietly do you think asked lanagan quickly eyeing the girl narrowly with those singularly penetrating eyes of his do you think it could have been possible that a person might have been concealed in that closet when you locked the office door for the night oh no no she answered quickly but her eyes involuntarily swept first to the closet and then to lanagan's face as though in secret anxious questioning why it makes me shiver even to think such a thing could have happened she added and she unmistakably shivered a little there was more conversation and lanagan fell to examining the room he first examined the closet then he opened the window and scrutinized the sill for a long time he got down on his knees and peered beneath the heat radiator of coiled pipes he lit a match the space between the bottom of the radiator and the floor being so slight that he could not examine it as closely as he seemed to want to expect your man to get into the room through that asked the public administrator with heavy facetiousness oh no replied lanagan smoothly it's just possible he got out of the room through it though and continued with his minute examination 
the stenographer grace northrup by name although assisting the other two sorting out papers found time each moment to flash a quick glance at lanagan whether it was merely active feminine curiosity i could not determine as for me i had been over the room half a dozen times already it held nothing further for me but i never could even guess at the clues lanagan might turn up on a trail that a dozen men had tramped over so i remained to see him work with keen interest when lanagan had finished we left now norrie my boy to the bush street office of the telephone company he said with as much enthusiasm as i ever saw him exhibit you are a fine old blunderbuss for fair but the others aren't any better plain as the nose on your face lord lord he stopped and looked at me laughing immoderately i was inclined to be a trifle sulky he made me feel like a six-dollar cub only he continued it's a three days trail that i have taken up and that dirk wielder has got just that much of a start always assuming for the sake of the argument that it was not stromberg i didn't ask him what he was going to the telephone office for it came to me with a sting that i had heard that same bit of information about the telephoning dropped during the last two or three days and in the press of clues that i considered more important had dismissed it which was the difference between jack lanagan and the rest of us he had that intuitive faculty of eliminating the superfluous and driving at the main fact it is after all a faculty found in all successful men of whatever occupation we both knew Lamb, traffic manager of the phone company. Lanagan asked for permission to talk with the girl who on Monday night handled the board having Bush 1243, Monteagle's number. Lamb was a substantial chap and promised to keep our visit in confidence. It was just before four o'clock and the four to ten shift of girls was coming on. In a few moments a young girl of sensible pleasant demeanor was shown to the room and Lamb retired after requesting that she give us all the information she might have on whatever subjects we discussed. You will be performing a service that will be appreciated, said Lanigan, if you could recall whether on Monday evening, along about eight o'clock, you had several calls for Bush 1243 yes sir i do she instantly answered it was not a busy night and i was handling three positions the call came from the east office we do not talk to the party direct on an outside call an east supervisor came on the line several times to instruct me to try and raise the number that is how i recall it so distinctly i may tell you that that is the telephone number of the office of mr monteagle who was murdered said lanagan i don't suppose you ever got a line on whom his telephone calls might be from as a general thing did you no sir she answered primly i pay no attention to whom is on the line thank you said lanagan i think you can be trusted not to say anything about our visit or questions yes sir she said we got a card of introduction from Lamb to Adams, manager of East Office, and hurried there. Wasn't that rather an indiscreet thing to do, tell her Monteagle's number, I suggested? Lanigan laughed and slapped me on the back. It was evident he was in high feather with himself. I was trundling along absolutely in the dark. My dear Norrie, when you meet a girl like that, take her into your confidence. Did you get that to whom? She smelt a rat and would have looked the number up and blown the glad tidings all over the office that a couple of detectives or newspaper men had been interviewing her on the murder. Recollect, too, that the telephone from the reporter's room at police headquarters comes in on this exchange. It's just possible that some of those gay young blades on night police have affiliations with some of these gay young blondes. I have got many a story through phone girls, and have occasionally lost a story through the same medium. Got me? As it stands, she is all puffed up with her own importance, and pat with us. There are times when you've got to take a chance at spilling your hand. This was one of them. I subsided, humbled. Not to occupy too much space with the merely routine details of working out the clue, we met Adams, another substantial chap. The chief operator recalled distinctly the number, more particularly because the woman calling it had been nervous and irritable. 
the call came she said from the public booth at shoemate's pharmacy it was only a couple of blocks away and we went there it was a large establishment with half a dozen clerks we worked down the list the fourth man had been on duty monday night and recalled a young woman who had entered the booth repeatedly on that evening she lived some place in the vicinity he said and usually got off the sutter street car shortly after five thirty o'clock the car stopped directly in front of the door and if we would wait he would point her out to us if she came that way this evening i took a position outside to signal in when a car approached and lanagan remained inside it was then just after five among the passengers from one car i noticed miss northrup and was about to step forward and speak to her on a chance of her dropping something additional when i caught a glimpse out of the tail of my eye of lanagan signalling me with a swift gesture i dodged around the corner before she saw me she passed on up sutter street and in a few moments lanagan picked me up his sallow face taking on a tinge of color and his dark eyes sparkling pretty near scrambled the eggs that time didn't you he chuckled that's the woman who did the telephoning i stared do you recall that furtive look with which she followed me at the office she lives just up there where we will let her rest for a time with her troubles and i fancy she has them let us go back to connor's i am to meet monahan there the king was waiting for us he took lanagan to one side all i could hear was lanagan's good once and then the king had slipped out the side door best single asset the police have is monahan said lanagan apropos of nothing in particular knows more about the night life of this city than any four men in it but he tips nothing that might hurt his own game or his own people in a way he preserves a certain code even while acting as a police stool in this matter however the invaluable mr monahan is working for jack lanagan and the police are consequently about three steps behind i see nothing in sight for some hours we will eat our dinner and take in a show for a few moments i rather anticipate a climax later and some rapid-fire work for us both on the typewriter i need a little stimulus that hasn't got wormwood in it he would give me absolutely not a line on his lay he could be a baffling enigmatic impersonal proposition when he took the humor we headed for the oyster loaf and i groaned for the four and a half that was between me and payday as lanagan methodically disposed of an onion soup special french mushrooms on toast a new york cut gorgonzola and a two-bit cigar he drank three glasses of ice water but that didn't cost anything a man's meal he said with a vast creature content now give me that other half you have left i want a shave you go up and touch dan for a five spot we may need expenses later i'll meet you at dan's at nine o'clock i want to pick monahan up again before i see you and also see leslie at the time appointed we met let's take a ten twenty thirty suggested lanagan by half past ten we will have to get busy there's a singer over at the continental that some of the dramatic critics say has real fire la patini i think she is called so we drifted into the continental and caught part of the performance there were trained birds of more than ordinary sagacity the stereotyped and fearful cornet soloist the girl singer la patini with a wonderful mezzo a remarkable beauty an undoubted future and an ability to sing the rosary in a manner to bring tears then came a slapstick tumbling act that was impossible and we left lanagan had suddenly become thoughtful do you know what i think he said i think the world would actually do better to sweep away every vestige of law and ordinance and make a clean start again our system of punishment is all wrong take one heinous class of crimes we punish the individual who takes upon herself to punish we say the state has the power of punishment and the prerogative and yet in the very crimes that are the most damnable the state can never interfere because the injured party must suffer in silence you might as well expect children to learn english through hieroglyphics as to make applicable to present-day conditions the antiquated penal code to which society is harnessed that's about enough of the sermon stuff it's not in my line 
lanagan was taking the lead but i was not altogether surprised when we finally found ourselves in the neighbourhood of the northrop home nor was i altogether surprised when chief leslie that shrewd and veteran thief-taker suddenly stepped from a doorway my mind shot ahead to the northrop home a few doors away and i could not bring myself to believe it could be possible that she was a principal brady is above said leslie he says she came in about twenty minutes ago we'd better move on her immediately said lanagan and in a moment more we were all three before the door to a lower flat of the old-fashioned sort with a bell jangling noisily as lanagan pulled out the handle it was miss northrup who answered the ring she had on a dressing-gown and her hair i could see had been taken down for retiring and then gathered in a loose coil on her head probably when the bell rang she opened the door but a few inches we would like to speak with you a moment miss northrup said lanagan he indicated the chief this is chief leslie kindly permit us to enter said the chief there was a shadow of authority in his tone and i knew that lanagan and the chief were planning a drive on the girl and that something would be stirring in this old-fashioned flat before long she hesitated a moment and then threw the door wide open and motioned us into the parlor in the hall a gas jet burned dimly as though for some member of the family who was not yet home she reached up and turned on the parlor light and as she did so her loosely coiled hair tumbled about her shoulders as the light struck down upon her features they had an appearance almost tragic be seated she said it needed no expert eye to detect in her drawn lips the evidence of nervous tension madam said leslie abruptly snapping his jaws like a trap and i knew this twenty-year-old girl was in for the third degree unless you at this time make a clean breast of all that you know concerning the murder of your employer ralph monteagle it will be necessary for me to book you for murder as an accessory before the fact she started violently her bosom began to rise and fall quickly it was evident a breakdown was imminent but she managed to say with considerable smoothness i know nothing more than i have already told the police and the reporters lanagan fierce eagerness glittering in his eyes stepped before her nevertheless possibly you know he said biting each word off short how many persons beside yourself and bartlett monteagle's former chauffeur who bought it knew of the rope in his closet knew that monteagle had a morbid fear of being trapped in that building at night by fire that he had had that fear since his friend mervyn was burned to death in the baldwin hotel fire and that he let no one know about the rope for fear of being ridiculed how many persons i say besides yourself and bartlett knew the rope was there and when you knew that that rope had disappeared as you must have known it why didn't you tell the police why did you permit a man to lie in prison whom you in your heart feel is innocent she sprang to her feet and threw both hands towards him as though warding off physical blows she was trembling in intense agitation don't don't oh for god's sake don't she sank back again into her chair her face buried in her hands rocking and moaning with lanagan standing over her inexorable as nemesis there was the sound of quick light running up the front stairs a key was turned in the lock and the front door swung open and the girl in the chair startled from her huddled misery sprang to her feet and fairly leaped to meet the newcomer she cried out but whether in warning or in the joy of greeting could not be said for her voice was half smothered in a sob sister she said at last falteringly sister please go to your room it is only some more policeman about mr monteagle the words came chokingly the other had not as yet come into our sight but now she stepped into the light that streamed from the parlor into the hall and i heard lanagan's swift involuntary ejaculation la patini her sister leslie swift as thought was half across the parlor floor to the hall yielding to a natural police impulse but the newcomer the other girl clinging to her stepped fully into the doorway to the parlor yes she said in a voice that had no tremor of emotion la patini her sister why 
why said leslie grimly because we were just going to book her for murder as an accessory before the fact we will switch the cut now and book you as the principal at the feet of the queenly patini the harassed sisters swooned lanagan pulled shut the door leading to the hall so that no one might by any mischance disturb us and i fell to chafing the wrists of the senseless girl la patini sank wearily to a chair stooping so that she could stroke her sister's temples i am glad it is over she said apathetically i have only wondered that it did not come sooner i have expected it hourly the story was soon told simple age-old but ever new sordid possibly to a slight degree but profoundly sad she who was now known as la patini met monteagle while visiting her sister at his office he had found means to extend the acquaintance had aided her in a secret way in her ambitions for the stage securing the engagement at the continental for her and as a result of the clandestine relation there had been a promise of marriage then had come the engagement announcement of the dennis and monteagle marriage and the awakening of the dupe but this was not the dupe of monteagle's many experiences the picture of miss dennison staring at her from the society columns had fired a sinister jealousy a confession had been made to the younger sister when la patini sought an opportunity of pleading once again alone with monteagle who had finally repudiated her the sister had admitted her to the office after monteagle left for the afternoon knowing he was to return in the evening she concealed herself in the closet before she entered the office her plan had been formed either monteagle would marry her or he would die at that time she had no thought of escaping she had heard the telephone ringing repeatedly heard the elevator boy enter the room just too late to get the party calling finally monteagle had arrived and she had discovered herself what happened was quickly over the quarrel was a few words and he had struck her with his fist she stabbed him to the heart and then with a vindictiveness that she could not now understand and shuddered at recalling had marred his features with the knife her first thought had been to give herself up then she wondered why she should do that the brief words of their quarrel had not been heard the janitor she could hear on the floor above after all she had done no more than kill a snake the thought of the rope came to her she knew about it because once when she was in the office as monteagle worked late she had expressed anxiety at being seen coming from the building with him and he had showed her the rope and jokingly offered to let her down from the window which opened upon a divisional alley in the rear of the sutton building the rope was of great length seeking for a place to tie it she naturally turned to the radiator the thought occurred to her with a flash her means of escape from the room might never be known if the rope was long enough to run under the radiator letting both ends to the ground she could then draw it down after she reached the ground by pulling on one end and letting it run under the radiator like a pulley she tried the length the light from the windows of the elevator shaft opening into the area way giving sufficient brightness as part of the preparation for the future on the stage that mr monteagle was to help me get she said dispassionately i have taken gymnasium work to build up my system you can see it was no extraordinary thing for me to let myself down by the double rope pulling the window shut after i climbed out i left it open enough so that the rope could run free when i pulled it after me i threw the rope in a street garbage tin i was at the theatre remarkable as it may seem in time for my act at ten o'clock although i missed the first show i have been in a daze since i was in a trance after i did the stabbing i have known i must be found out i am glad that it is all over i have made no attempt to escape i am absolutely indifferent to my fate the sister recovered from her swoon was weeping softly her head bowed on the other's lap tell me said lanagan curiously to her why did you telephone to monteagle she gasped and it appeared for the moment that she was about to swoon again finally she faltered while her own sister looked at her strangely i was afraid sister meant him harm i didn't think of it until i, I got home and then something about her face came back to me i wanted to warn mr monteagle not to arouse her 
I finally succeeded in getting him at his club before he left for his office, and he only laughed. Yes, said La Pettini bitterly. He told me so, and laughed, and snapped his fingers when he spoke about you. That was just before he struck me, and then I killed him. The sudden fresh sobs of the younger girl, smothered as they were in her sister's lap, seemed to wrench her very being. Lanigan glanced at Leslie. Leslie averted his eyes. There was a prolonged pause, broken only by the agonized, stifled sobbing, while she of crime threw her arms shelteringly around the weaker vessel, but her own deathly calm she preserved. Finally, Leslie rose slowly and said simply, I am sorry. I have no recourse. My duty is clear. So is mine, said Lanigan quickly, and it is this. I will guarantee you, Miss Northrup, the support of the inquirer, and I will secure for you as counsel my personal friend, Mr. William Haddon, the ablest man in the West, to present your case to a jury in the proper manner to secure the acquittal that you are entitled to. It was then after one o'clock. We left Leslie at the house to bring the girl to the city prison after she had an opportunity of parting from her family. Leslie was to contrive not to book her before half-past two to save our exclusive. By that time, the Times and the Herald would be gone to press. On our hurried trip to the office, where I took vast delight marching in on Samson with a grin, Lanigan supplied me with the missing links. He spoke of finding a few strands from a manila rope sticking beneath the radiator, and of his instant surmise as to the precise way in which the escape had been made. Monahan located Bartlett, Monteagle's former chauffeur, who had taken a public stand, and from him learned of the rope that Monteagle had in his closet, which Bartlett had bought. Lanigan knew from his careful search that the rope was not in the closet when he made his examination, and he promptly concluded that Miss Grace Northrup must have known who committed the crime. She knew the rope was there, according to Bartlett, and Lanigan rightly surmised that she must have known of its disappearance. Robbery not having been the motive, Lanigan had rapped to the theory of a jealous or vengeful woman who had deliberately marred the features after death. His police experience had included a case or two where somewhat similar conditions had been present. It was from Bartlett that the first tip came on La Patini, although he did not know, and neither did Lanigan at that time, that she was the sister of Monteagle's stenographer. All he knew was that until he left Monteagle's employ, she seemed to be the favored of the alliances that the broker secretly maintained. Lanigan had discovered that La Patini had missed her first show on Monday night, and the circumstance was sufficient to stir his suspicions, although it must be confessed that until the development at the home, where her relationship to Miss Northrop was disclosed, nothing positive had been secured against her. The moment the relationship was made clear, both Lanigan and the chief had instantly reached the same conclusion. The drive had been made, and the confession followed. "'Great, Jack, great,' said Samson, with as much enthusiasm as his thin blood could support. "'Gad, what a wailing we gave him! What a wailing!' The inquirer had smeared the story over three pages, breaking all make-up rules on type display. It was a clean exclusive in every detail. "'Well, Samson,' replied Lanigan, "'it isn't much to be proud of at that. Only it's all in our game.' but I've given my promise, and we've got to get that girl acquitted. Well, that's up to you, said Samson. The paper's yours. End of Whatsoever a Man Soweth 